Join me in what we might call dedicating this Sabbath sharing to the paradoxical twist of giving up Lent for Lent. <laughs> Patrick's story begins in Roman Britain, not quite 400 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. Patrick was a son of a wealthy and respected family and spent his early days living a life of privilege and comfort in what is now called Scotland. It has been suggested that from an early age he was a thoughtful young man who thanked God often for the blessings a generous deity had bestowed upon him. Then one day, at the age of 16, his life changed suddenly and dramatically. He was abducted by a band of pirates who shackled him, took him to Ireland, where he was sold into slavery. For the next six years, Patrick tended sheep for his owner. And throughout this ordeal, though, Patrick never lost sight of who his true master was. Day after day, year after year, Patrick continued to pray and to thank God for all that he had. He never lost faith that all things work toward liberation and awakening for those who love God with all the strength of their mind and their, and their heart and their hands. As his faith grew, Patrick began to have visions, visions that he sensed were divine in origin. The vision led Patrick to stow away on a ship that took him to the northern coast of Gaul. From there, he returned to Britain and his family, and at the age of 22, found himself on fire with a missionary zeal to convert the Irish from their snake-worshipping paganism to the light-hearted joys of fifth-century Christianity. <laughs> Finally, in 431 CE, Patrick was nominated to be the first bishop of the Irish. His joy was short-lived, however, as his nomination was rejected by Pope Celestine I because of a sin he had committed in his youth. And I must apologize. Look as I may, I could not uh, find the details of his sin. If you want to look, I'd suggest you check the National Enquirer. Maybe they'll have it. <laughs> the Pope went on to appoint Palladius, the first bishop of the Irish in 431, but Patrick's fervor to bring Christianity to Ireland was not to be denied. After serving as bishop for less than a year, Palladius passed on. And in 432, the Pope appointed Patrick Bishop of Ireland. At last, his dream of introducing the Irish to the Catholic Church's fifth century interpretation of the Jesus ethic was his to live out on the Emerald Isle. Although opposed by the priests of Ireland's indigenous snake-worshipping religion, Patrick preached on and finally started to secure some grudging toleration from the Celtic homeboys. He even succeeded in convincing some of the native sons to destroy the symbols, carvings, and statues of snakes that they had once worshipped, giving rise to the myth of Patrick ridding the Emerald Isle of, of snakes. He went on to develop a native clergy by inspiring his followers to construct monasteries to house initiates he could then transform into monks dedicated to the disciplines and religious practices of fifth century Catholicism. He established many dioceses and began to hold church council meetings on a regular basis. Patrick's religious philosophy is historically acknowledged to be quite orthodox and typically interpreted as anti-Pelagian or pro-Augustinian, who were the two most eminent Catholic theologians of their time. Sadly, poignantly, 1,600 years down the road from Augustine's spiritually barren proclamations on the nature of the is, far too many Christian folks still find themselves laboring in the intolerable embrace of Augustine's notion that God foreknows and predetermines the outcome of all things including an individual's life and eternal destiny. And typically, it's not a very pretty story. But thankfully, there were 
other entities at work in Ireland at the same time. Consider now the spiritual wisdom of one of these mystical representatives of the we people, Louis, the leprechaun. Listen carefully. This is from Louis. It's translated in 1989 by Consi Brooks, who rejoiced upon her last St. Patrick's Day. Begosh and Begari, such a blessing it is to be talking with you like this. Indeed, it warms the very cockles of my heart, for there's so much pent up inside me yearning to be shared, but there's such a sadness too. I, what I got to be saying is hard, so I may as, I may as well be right into it. High time it is for we, we leprechauns, to come out from places neath the shamrocks and the toadstools where we do our work for the world and put an end to a might of a myth you humans have. It is the myth of luck. Heaven knows you've been carrying that bit of blarney with you these centuries and it would be best to be rid of it once and for all, this idea of luck. Don't you know that each time one of you says good luck to the other, wishing for some chance occurrence, of fortune to befall your friend, a leprechaun sheds a great green tear. Don't you know that each time one of you thanks your lucky stars, or hopes for a lucky day, or searches for a four-leaf clover, or clings to a shiny good luck coin, you're subscribing in your mind to some kind of random magic being at work in this universe. You're holding in your consciousness to something that simply does not exist at least in the silly way you perceive it, and we, we folks, we weep. Wake up. Wake up, me fine fair friends. Wake up to what's true in the universe. Wake up to knowing there's no such thing as luck, and what you persist in calling luck, even in this wonderful new age, for shame, for shame, is but a momentary glimmer of something far more glorious the endless movement of God's Holy Spirit all around you, not by accident, but by grand design. And tis nothing you can do nor say to will entice it any closer, for it is already the ever-present intimate constant of your lives. Would you but know it in your hearts and feel it in the core of your being? And how am I to be doing that, I can hear you ask. Indeed, you might well ask, what is the most important question you could ever bear to your soul? I, I would be so good if I could tell you what to do, for how you human beings love something to do. But the truth is, and here's where the going gets tricky, that making the switch from holding to the capriciousness of luck to resting in bliss in a perpetual captive of his spirit involves not so much something you do, but something you stop doing. Aye, it means you need to stop. Stop believing in everything you heretofore have been given to believe, for secondhand believing keeps you from firsthand experiencing. Stop adding to existence with thoughts you conjure up in your mind, for existence is perfect just the way it is before you start your meddling with it. And stop looking for other things to do to bring you happiness, for looking points you towards the future. And happiness becomes clearly obvious when you're standing at your place in the present. And then, soon enough, as sure as the showers of March give the glistening glow of emeralds to the hills of Erin, you will stop altogether, for you will find there is no ye at all, only he loving us, leading us, and shedding his grace o'er all. And just like our great common friend, Jesus of Mechnazareth, <laughs> you'll be saying with every breath you breathe, I, I and me Father are one. And knowing this is all the luck you'll ever need. From Louis. Happy birthday. <laughs>